And so we're going to talk about accretion disks today. So I think they're pretty cool. Um, so I guess the first question is, why do matter accretes in uh, the shape of a disk as opposed to a sphere? Doesn't it have to do with how a black hole is rotating? Yeah, it definitely has to do with uh, with angular momentum, with rotation. And almost everything has angular momentum. Are we recording, Jorge? Just, just got here. Yep, I'm recording. OK, thank you. Yep, thank you. So you know, if you have your uh, interstellar material, and you're going to grab that part to create your, uh, you know, your star or whatever you're going to form, a black hole. If the interstellar medium is completely at rest, then uh, it will have a spherical symmetry, and it will coalesce, kind of like a, um, in the way we have seen with regular stars. But if it has some velocity, it doesn't matter really in what direction, then this is going to have a center of mass. And if it has a velocity, then it's going to have uh, an angular momentum as well. So it probably requires some um, I guess like substantial value of the velocity uh, for it to form a disk uh, because once it starts to gravitate towards the center, towards the center of mass, then you're going to have uh, you know, a lot of collisions in between. But you, know, you might end with, uh, I guess the the limiting cases will be a very thin, uh, elongated disk that is traveling, that is uh, rotating very fast, or more like a you know spherical conglomerate of things. It will be the other um, limiting case. So most of the time, it's going you're going to have you're going to end up with some sort of disk, and you know this happens pretty much at every uh, hierarchy. So you can form galaxies this way. You know, they're going to flatten a little as they start uh, rotating, or well, if they have uh, angular momentum. Uh, you can also form uh, protoplanetary disks with this, uh, so with this uh, with approach. And you, know, you can form planets from these disks and you know even at the hierarchy or the level of planets you can still see this effect right like you have the the rings of uh, saturn for example right so there's always some sort of um not always but very often it's very common that you're going to have some sort of accretion going on so um, it is uh, ubiquitous and the other interesting characteristic about it is its luminosity. So uh, we derive this one. I guess I'll just use L. So this was the uh, Eddington limit. This one's a little better. Mm -hmm. 
And so, L E, the Eddington luminosity, it's going to be um, C over kappa for pi G M. So can someone tell me uh, what is the Eddington luminosity or the Eddington limit? Uh, this kappa is the opacity right, of the material. Uh, and I put a T over there because uh, typically it's going to be Thomson uh, scattering that produces this opacity. C is the speed of light, uh, gravitational constant, total mass. This is the luminosity kind of at the, the edge with the surface. So what is the Eddington luminosity? Maximum luminosity that a star can have. And it depends a little bit on its composition, right, through the opacity but mostly on the mass. So the more massive stars are more luminous, but they cannot be more luminous than this value. If they are, then the radiation pressure is greater than the gravitational uh, force, pressure, I guess. And so it will just expand, right? or explode if it's very uh, violent. Well, we're going to see that for uh, disks, accretion disks, this is a little, it's a little different. Okay, so uh, in one case, you know, we're going to have this is like a sphere. You have your mass in the center. We just have, you know, a spherical accretion. Um, the other uh, option is with a cylindrical symmetry. So you have your center of mass, and you know it was initially moving with some velocity. Let's say to this side, and so it will start uh, to you know rotate around the center of mass. And you're going to have a rotation over here as well. So over here, We have um, radiation pressure, gravitational force, and um, centripetal, uh, sorry, centrifugal uh, force because it is rotating. So notice in the case of the cylindrical symmetry that, you know, let's say that you have a pretty homogeneous distribution of mass. Uh, in that case, you know, you still have a center of mass. So the mass that is above the center of mass will be pulled down. And the mass that is below, it's going to be uh, put up uh, just due to gravity. So it doesn't matter if it starts in a very, you know, a very um, homogeneous configuration it will start to collapse um, a little bit into a disk. And you know, this matter over here probably is going to follow you know, 
a path more like this, and it's going to, there's going to be many collisions uh, along the way. But even if there's not a lot of mass anymore, because most of the mass is in the center, um, at some point is, it has to uh, interact with the matter, with the rest of the mass. And so, you know, maybe it's going to knock off some of the matter over here, but then it will just go back because there's more mass in the center. So you can see how um, just from uh, the minimization of its gravitational potential, the disk is the configuration that is going to minimize that potential. So, you know, unless it starts very close to uh, not moving at all, you end up with some sort of disk. Uh, the other thing is that the angular momentum has to be conserved, right? So um, let's say that you, well, you know, that we carved out this part from um, the rest of the interstellar medium. This is the, you know, the gene's mass and it is collapsing. Uh, then you can assume that this is um, an isolated system. And so the uh, angular momentum for the whole system has to be conserved. So if, let's say, you know, matter moves over here and loses the velocity because of the interactions with the other particles, then it has to pay that um, angular momentum penalty. So it means that the particles that are further away, you know, will have to uh, start moving uh, at a higher speed. So we're going to look at some of the uh, specifics of that of this situation. So let's say that R, uh, sorry, uh, omega of R is the um, angular frequency. Um, for a body, so this is going to have going to look like a, just like a disk, so cylindrical um, symmetry. And this is your center of mass. This is going to be R. And this is going to be a continuum, right? So there's nothing special about this R in particular. Uh, in general, you're going to have a different angular frequency at different radii. Does that make sense? That it's different? No? If you just have a rigid rod, let's say, like this, um, and you rotate it. The angular frequency, does it depend on the radius? Or no? Well, it doesn't, right? But in a disk, you can have a high velocity here, medium here, and like low velocity at the edges. And this will comply with uh, Kepler's third law. Okay, so what Kepler says is that 
this angular frequency squared is g m over r cubed. So this implies that if you multiply times r, you get g m over r squared. So this is um, the centripetal force divided by some mass. So it's a centripetal force per unit mass. So we need to remember that one. The other component is the, well, the second component is the, uh, the thermal or the radiation pressure. So let, this is the opacity. This is vector L over C B the radiation force per mass. So in order for that to be true, what does L, the vector L, need to be? Well, we had um, opacity and speed of light. So L is going to be a vector in the direction of radiation. So if you have your disk over here, it's going to be R. Um, L is going to also be uh, moving away from the disk. It doesn't have to be at the center, but it has to be moving away because it is radiation. So L can be over here. And the magnitude is going to be energy per time and per area. So the units of the opacity are meters square per kilogram. And this one will be uh, meters per second. So we can um, L has units of joules, so energy per second per area, so meter square. This is oops. This one is going to be kilogram. per second cube. So we can put this one over here, kilogram, second cube, we get rid of the kilograms, and we end up with meters per second squared, which is what 
we would expect for force divided by mass, right? So this is just an acceleration. So if you had, spherical symmetry, then L will be, script L will be the luminosity, so energy per second or per unit time, uh, divided by the surface, surface area. But uh, we do not have, we are not assuming spherical symmetry in this case. So we're gonna leave it as um, vector L for, for now. The third term is the gravitational potential. So centripetal uh, force, um, radiation force, and gravitational force. Those are the three things that we have at play over here. So the gravitational potential, P, is just GM divided by R. So this is the gravitational energy um, divided by uh, dm. So that is the potential. So the gravitational force per unit mass is negative gradient of the gravitational potential. So we have everything, the centripetal, um, radiation, and gravitational forces as a function uh, of, of the mass. So we can arrange them in an equation, inequality actually. So the centripetal part plus the radiation part has to be less than the gravitational part. So um, why is this the case? What does it mean? Well, the centripetal, you know, it's pushing matter away. The radiation pressure is also pushing matter away and gravity is pulling matter in. So if this is true, then that means that you know, your disk or your, your system uh, is gravitationally bound. So this is similar to what happens with the Eddington uh, limit. If for some reason you know, the luminosity goes above the Eddington limit, then it will expand. You know, the radiation pressure will be greater than in gravity. So the star will expand, it will cool down. And uh, it might be the case that uh, you don't have nuclear reactions anymore, and so it will cool down and make uh, 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 small again. So you have your, your equilibrium. And it's the same thing here, except that we have this additional term 
due to the centripetal um, component. So, you know, these two vectors are pointing out and this one is pointing in. And this inequality holds for the components of the vectors. And this is um, equation 3.5.1 in Weinberg. Okay, so notice that if this term is zero, then you just have the spherical component. So this will just give you the Eddington luminosity. Okay, so from this inequality, we can get the vector L. It has to be smaller than C over kappa and then minus this one. And plus this one. So this is the luminosity or the energy per unit time per unit area. So it's equal to, if we integrate it, um, I'm gonna write it over here. If we integrate it with dA, so the um, infinitesimal um, area vector, then for the whole area, then that is the luminosity, so the energy per unit time. So if we want to get the luminosity, we can just integrate this whole thing. This will be dA. Uh, there's a dot over here because these are all vectors. And this is uh, over the whole area. So again, this is general. It's not assuming um, any particular configuration. So here we can use to solve this integral, you can use the divergence theorem. So the volume or Gauss theorem. The integral of the volume of the divergence of F is equal to the area integral right, which is what we have over here. So this area integral, we can transform it into a volume integral. So that.
So if we take the divergence of this one, What is that? That's the uh, Poisson equation. And it is uh, well known for a gravitational potential. It is four pi g Rho. Rho is the density. So we have this term. What about this other one? Well, that one. It's going to be divergence. Um, Call this one uh, u and v. So this term actually, this is not going to be a vector because it's a divergence. Right, so it's just the chain rule. So R is vector in the plane, right? So that means that it has some value in X, some value in Y, and zero in Z, it's just a disk. So, so I'm gonna drop this. So just from the definition of the divergence, it's gonna be the derivative with respect to X of X plus the derivative with respect to Y of y plus the derivative with respect to z of zero. So that's zero. This one is one. This one is also one. So one plus one, two. So I can put it over here. Let's put it here so it's a little bit more clear. And this one let's just leave it for now as R derivative with respect to R of this guy. Okay, so if we do all that. we get that L max, so now I'm gonna make it equal and call it L max. C over kappa. Mm. I'm gonna continue over here. This is, well, I guess I'm gonna put it over here. C over kappa.
right? So this is dv, and this is multiplying the whole thing. Okay, so this is a constant, this is a constant. Um, what is the integral, volume integral of rho with v? Well, rho is mass over volume. If we integrate over volume, we'll get mass. So this is 4 pi uh, g n. And so this is just the, you know, with c and divided by kappa, this is the Eddington luminosity. And then we have this other term over here. So this is a negative. Uh, this one, let's call it LE. Well, it is LE. Uh, this is negative. So is the maximum luminosity that can be achieved by a, by an accretion disk is it greater than or smaller um, or less than the Eddington luminosity? Any guesses? There's a negative here. So if we consider a rigid disk, I guess I don't have a rigid disk over here, but let's say a Frisbee, then what is the dependence of the angular frequency with, with R, with the radius? Well, it's constant, right? They have to move at the same rate. So then this whole thing is a constant. And we just have uh, integral of V dV. And what is the derivative with respect to the radius of that one? Well, since it is a constant, this is zero. And so we just have this negative term. And so the maximum luminosity of the accretion disk is less than the Eddington luminosity, which is just you know, the this, this spherical symmetry. But as we mentioned before, Uh, this is not a rigid disk, so the inner parts are rotating faster than the outer parts. So that means that they follow. Okay, so we have this one over here. Uh, let's, let's concentrate on this term. know from Kepler's third law that is some constant, it's called K, and then it has a dependence on the radius, a negative three halves. So I remember This is Kepler's third law. So we take this one. So the square 
is k squared r to the negative three. So if we take the derivative with respect to the radius, this is just k squared, this will be r to the negative three, we get minus three k squared over r to the fourth. And for this term, we actually had um, an r over here. Oh, here. So we can get rid of this one with this one. So this whole term is negative 3k squared over r cubed. And the other term that we had, the two uh, omega squared was a function of r. So there would be two. k squared over r to negative three, so r cubed over here. So the two terms inside the integral are two k squared over r cubed minus three k squared over r cubed. So it's actually a negative inside uh, of the integral, or well, that that part of the integral. So that whole part is negative integral over the whole volume. k squared over r cubed dv. So this is just equal to that's an ugly integral. Right? So if we put everything together, we get that the maximum luminosity is equal to the Eddington luminosity C over Kappa Thompson integral over the volume of the angular frequency squared, which is a function of the radius, dv. Is this greater than the uh, Eddington luminosity? Anyone paying attention? <laughs> George, you have an opinion. Yes, it is greater, right? Yes, it is. Thanks. So does it have a, so this is the angular frequency squared, which is a function of the radius. You're integrating or the whole volume the whole accretion volume. Is there a limit for the maximum luminosity? There should be. What will the limit be? What will impose that limit? Mm. 
the parent object, I guess. Yeah. This is a pretty cool equation, if you look at it. So it tells you that if things are spinning faster, then your luminosity increases. There's a limit to how fast they can spin. It will be the speed of light. And well, wouldn't it be also the, the speed of like it to get out of the the gravity of the parent object too? Mm, what do you mean? An escape velocity, I guess. The point it turns itself apart, you mean? Yes, uh, it could definitely turn itself apart if it's rotating too fast. Uh, so what happens is with things that are rotating really, really fast, like uh, neutron stars and, and black holes, they are very compact, right? So if you have a compact object, so let's say, um, you know, 10 kilometers, a neutron star, uh, as opposed to the sun, which, what is the radius of the sun? Like something times 10 to the eight meters. Um, so you have a lot of matter that can travel closer to the object if the object is compact. Um, so if you have something that is the size of the sun, uh, yes, you know, they're gonna be rotating around, but not as fast as if they're very close to the center. And you can imagine uh, like an ice skater, right? Just rotating. So the idea of to conserve if everything goes to, towards the center, then it has to rotate much faster. If it rotates much faster, then the maximum luminosity is higher. So uh, the hard limit you know, will be the speed of light. It will probably tear itself apart if it is rotating close to that speed, but it can still rotate pretty fast. So this is the most energetic um, natural phenomenon, right? That, that, that we know about. So in the case of a quasar, you have a supermassive black hole, like the ones that you find in the center of galaxies, and you have matter uh, accreting. And it's, these things are not that big. I think they're like 10 to the four kilometers or something. And you know, they have like a billion or several billion, I guess it can be hundreds of billions of masses, solar masses. So you can have stuff that is rotating really, really fast. And this is uh, all classical. So in the case of uh, black holes, you have to also consider that they're dragging space time. Um, but this is still like the same, you know, basic, basic phenomenon that is rotating uh, really fast. So that's why you know, quasars can uh, produce you know, so much more light than, or luminosity, you know, radiation, than anything else that, that we know about. It's because of this. Would the L max be infinity or would it be zero? Mm, it will never be infinity because this cannot go to, it cannot rotate infinitely fast. But, you know, it can get really high. Like this is just regular stars, right? The Eddington luminosity. Could you ever calculate it for a black hole or a quasar? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it has been done. So, for a quasar, I think the the maximum luminosity. Actually, their actual luminosity, right, is 
like a thousand times the luminosity of the Milky Way. Like the whole 200 billion stars in the Milky Way combined. Um, but that's probably not close to the theoretical uh, limit. So, okay, now we see this, this stuff. Um, there are a few other things to, to consider. So, you know, first, um, almost everything, as I mentioned, um, is going to have some accretion disk, everything big in the universe. So the accretion disk of a protostar or a young star is going to radiate. So you have this luminosity. If you look at the uh, wavelength, this will be just like the black uh, black body radiation. Um, like this, right? So the peak for protostars is in the infrared. And for uh, neutron stars and black holes, They are um, X-rays. So we have looked at this, the strong grand spheres. And so these are created by the most massive stars, right? So type O or type B. Um, what is their, their peak? Or what? In in what um, range do they radiate most of their energy? Those stars. You remember? UV, right? So um, UV is going to be over here, not in maybe in between. Actually, it's closer to infrared than to X rays. So ultraviolet. So you know the, the bigger the biggest stars they radiate in uh, in UV. But the accretion disks around black holes and neutron stars, they radiate in X-rays. And it's kind of the you know, the only thing that we know can uh, shift is really high, high energies. So, you know, black holes are only black to a certain extent, right? You can see the X-rays produced by uh, matter being accelerated uh, towards the black hole. So somehow, you know, this is kind of my my own bias, uh, but somehow I think that stars are more stable than than accretion disks, right? Like you consider, well, I consider an accretion disk um, kind of like a transient phenomenon, right? Like is in the process of getting somewhere, whereas the star has a shift, you know, reaching that place, reaching somewhere. But I think that's incorrect. You know, I think um, we should consider these accretion disks to be at the same level of, uh, of stars. They can last for, for a very long time, um, certainly longer than, than some stars, you know, at least 100 million years or something. So these are not that transient, you know, these are actual actual systems that last for a while. Okay, let's see.
Okay. Well, aren't they just like incomplete stellar objects, stellar structures? Like how the Kuiper belt and the Orient belt is like just remnants of uh, early solar system? Mm. So I think the Kuiper belt uh, also has a shape of a disk, right? Yeah, I think so. So I was thinking about uh, the Oort cloud. You know, if if it does exist, uh, it seems to have a like a spherical planet nine. I think planet nine would be. In, well, I don't know. I thought it was in the in the Kuiper uh, region, but uh, might be wrong. So, you know, the, the Oort cloud is spherical. So it kind of, kind of gives you the boundary, right, of the, of the um, I guess, where the sun started or the solar system started collapsing. And so over there, you didn't have a lot of material that was heavily attracted to the disk or starting transferring angular momentum to the disk. So it kind of just stay there. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I think that we should give respect to these quasars and say that they are things, not that they are processes. <laughs> okay, so why planets, you know, let's say the earth, uh, why did they? Why they don't um, accrete towards uh, the sun? Why are we still around? Because of the orbital speed we have. So you can think of a particle, you know, just you know, an accretion disk that has the same orbital speed as the Earth. And it will it's the same reason. Um, it's the same reason why it's so hard to get to the to the sun. It's because we're both going so fast, right? Mm. Hmm. I haven't thought about that. <laughs> um. Well, anyways. What I wanted to get to with this question is the accretion disk is kind of a continuum. So you have uh, the particles interacting with each other often. Right? It, it starts to get pretty dense. Um, it's not like, a, um, you know, like a sphere in which you can spend years, you know, without seeing an interaction between the particles. But they're probably not as dense as the sun or the earth, but you have collisions uh, that are very, very common. So as opposed to the planets, the material in the accretion disk is in physical contact. So the way you can simulate that is um, as, a, as a fluid. So you have to assume that the accretion disk is a gas, um, not an ideal gas, like there are um, interactions. So, there's a higher velocity at smaller uh, radius. So what ultimately describes the behavior or the dynamics 
of the accretion disk is the Navier Stokes equation. Which is pretty complicated. I don't know if you have seen it. So the particles are going to lose energy and momentum uh, as they interact. So there's um, viscous uh, friction. And this friction is actually what produces the, the luminosity. If you just had the particle you know, rotating really fast around whatever object you have, um, you know, it will produce, if, it, if it's a charged particle, it will produce some, some radiation. Um, but if it's not a charged particle, then it will, it will not produce anything. It will just be rotating around. But because they interact with each other, so you know, if this one is rotating faster than this one, then this one is going to transfer some energy to this one. This one is going to slow down and it's going to move um, further in. So what is actually creating that luminosity is that uh, they are colliding you know, all the time with each other. So the exact process by which um, viscosity operates in accretion disks is not known. So it is believed that uh, turbulence has uh, an important role. But you know, all of this stuff, you know, we know the basics, but it's, it's kind of unknown. The details are unknown. So if a particle moves from R plus DR over here to R over here, then the change in the uh, thermal energy is going to be one half of GM DM. So the particle has mass DM. over R minus G M D small m over R plus D R. Why one half? Well, uh, this is a two dimensional system, right? it's a disc. So you have uh, two degrees of freedom. So you can move uh, radially outward or you can move, um, um, I guess, perpendicular to parallel to the tangent. So if you move to a lower, a, a smaller radius, then you have to pay the, the penalty. So some of that, you're, you're falling into the object. So your velocity has to increase. But that's only the velocity that is uh, parallel to the tangent. The other part, so the other half, uh, it will be, you know, will be equivalent to the radial direction. So it's the, it's the disordered um, the kinetic energy, so the, the thermal energy that is you know, allowed to interact with the other ones. So the luminosity, let's look over here. The derivative of the luminosity is the derivative of the uh, yeah, this is the thermal thermal energy with respect to time. So this is one half. Uh, GM, DM, 
you have all of that stuff over here. DT. One over R plus one over R plus DR. So this is a change in mass with respect to time. So this is a mass transfer. You can call it M dot. And this one is just R plus DR. Uh, oh, sorry, this one was minus. Minus R over R squared plus R dr. So this one, R minus R, they go away. And this R dr is much smaller than R squared. So we can ignore it. So the luminosity going to be equal to that. So the, the mass transfer has to be a constant. Otherwise, uh, you will have accumulation of matter uh, in some of these regions. But the mass function, the mass does depend on the radius. Um, and you can look at you know, the simpler cases or simpler mass distributions to um, solve this integral. Um, and this L uh, is going to be related to, as we saw before, the, the black body uh, radiation. So you can get a dependence you know, by, by observing the luminosity uh, the spectrum of the luminosity. Uh, you can infer this this function, or you know anything that you observe in space. The the mass distribution. All right, so that's what I had for you today. Any questions or comments? I personally have none. Okay. We had some more people who, who joined in, but then left, okay. <laughs> I was about to say. Yeah. All right. Um, I guess I'll see you on Thursday then. All right, I'll see you on Thursday. You then. We'll, look at, right. we'll start looking at the right. on Thursday. All right, have a good day or good night. Bye. Good evening.